Um, hi everyone, thanks for showing up today even though it's the last day of the summit. So everyone is pretty much tired, but we'll try to entertain you as much as we can. So uh, today we're going to talk about uh, building a Ceph cluster for your first or maybe not the first OpenStack cloud because what has been happening over the course of last two years is that everyone is talking about Ceph. Some folks like Mirantis is deploying Ceph and uh, we still get the same questions on how to plan this, the, cluster, the, the cluster properly, how to plan for performance, what Ceph is doing, what Ceph is not doing. So over the course of the last six months, what we, have, what, what we happen to have in Mirantis is we happen like a, to establish a number of rules of thumb and a couple of magic numbers of how it is relatively easy to, calc uh, how it is relatively easy to calculate the Ceph cluster sizing and the Ceph cluster capacity. Uh, that will power, obviously, OpenStack Cloud. So my name is, uh, today we will do the, my name is Dmitry Novakovsky, I'm a solutions architect at Mirantis EMEA. Uh, so today we will do, uh, with, with a couple of good colleagues, we will do a Ceph, of, with, we'll do a Ceph overview. We'll talk a little bit about what Ceph it is uh, in overall, just to make sure in case someone is not yet familiar here. Uh, we will tell you about how to plan your hardware with a couple of examples and a couple of numbers which you can use after you walk away from the session and start planning your cluster and figuring out how much capacity and how much performance you need. And we will tell you about uh, a few lessons learned, sometimes pain in a painful way, which we did in, re in reality in the deployments which uh, Mirantis has been doing over the course of last year. So with this, I would like to hand over to Udo for the Ceph overview part. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Dimitri. And as mentioned already, so my name is Udo Seidel. I'm not working for, for Mirantis, but working with Mirantis. Uh, and uh, after my part of the session, I'll hand over to Craig, who will guide you through the, through the hardware planning. So now we mentioned all the three names. Let's start a little bit with Ceph. Now, if you go to OpenStack events these days, as big as the summit or as small as a meetup in Outback somewhere, uh, then people are talking, writing, speaking about Ceph left, right, and center. So it looks like in these days, Ceph is really the de facto standard for being storage in, in the OpenStack world. However, Ceph is much more, uh, and it can provide much more, even outside the OpenStack world. So I would like to do with you a little journey into Ceph land, apart from the OpenStack part of the, of the universe of it. Ceph, as mentioned here, is an open source, uh, software-defined storage solution. And interestingly, it's not the only one available. There are more uh, software-defined storage solutions available, and there are even more, uh, there are even more open source software-defined storage solutions available. And if you just focus at Red Hat, the company in these days behind Ceph, uh, you will see that they actually have two solutions available. So before they acquired Ink Tank in 2014, they had already ClusterFS, which they got via the acquisition of Cluster in 2011. So something must be really unique and different for Ceph to actually be, in these days, the de facto standard on, uh, for, for OpenStack and maybe also for, for other bits and pieces. And this is quite interesting. I'm pleased about that one because when I started working, or when I actually set up my first Ceph cluster uh, in, in the lab, was in 2010, and then I didn't think about this involvement that it will be for open source infrastructure as a service solution, the storage uh, solution available. So when I looked at it, I was really concentrating on, on this part, so the distributed file system layer. Back then in our data center, we had roughly 2,000 2, servers available, Linux servers. Uh, not all of them highly utilized, so I thought about, hey, that sounds interesting. I just put some Ceph demons over there, they create a common namespace, and then out of the sudden, I can use the compute resources and the, uh, the storage resources to dump my data in there. Now, things have changed a lot since, since, since then. And also, the development of Ceph has changed during, during the years. So it started with the file system layer, but then later on, they concentrated much more on the core, on the heart of, of the storage engine, which is which is Rados. And this is actually where all the magic and all the beauty things of Ceph happens. And with this shift, uh, making this one industry ready, robust, reliable, improve and enhancement, they actually uh, built the foundation for then exposing this nice storage engine via different functional and technical APIs to clients, uh, to other softwares, uh, to applications, and so on and so forth. For instance, for, for OpenStack. So object storage is something which, of course, is uh, well known in the OpenStack context. It's there since the beginning. 
but it also has use cases uh, and business cases outside OpenStack. So I recently talked to people working for a hospital, and they use an object store. They use Ceph as an object store, store to store medical data there, like x-ray pictures and something like that. This is totally a site of OpenStack, but they still use the same interface which you use in OpenStack for Ceph, the object store. Um, and if you were used to run your stuff, uh, for instance, on Amazon S3, with some tricks, you can also pretend that your Ceph cluster actually is Amazon S3, and you can use all the tooling you had in place for talking to Amazon, short term also talking to Ceph, and storing the data there using the, the object store interface. Now, for some people, especially in traditional data centers, using HTTP as a protocol to store data is not something they really like or understand, and they really would like to talk SCSI or, or at least block device layer. Uh, and Ceph can help here as well. So there's, on top of Rados, there's an additional protocol called Rados Block Device Layer, and that one you can actually use to uh, carve out part of your Ceph cluster and make it available like, like a block device. And on the Linux side, with the corresponding driver, you can actually create an entry in the dev directory so it really does look like a, uh, either a local disk or a disk you would normally get out of a traditional uh, SAN interface, a SAN environment via iSCSI or via fiber channel. Uh, things and like that. So again, this is used in, in OpenStack as well for different use cases, but it's also useful, for instance, if you want to replace your traditional SAN setup uh, in a classical active standby high availability cluster with Ceph. And I've seen this in small implementations. So people have not really thrown away, but have decommissioned their fiber channel uh, switches and the storage arrays and implemented a similar thing uh, with Ceph in the background using the block device interface and then the cluster management software on top. Last but not least from those uh, more functional APIs, the, the file storage. As I said before, this is where Ceph started as a distributed file system. And then it was left behind a little bit. And back then I thought, yeah, maybe it's not needed anymore because we have an interface library to talk directly to Labos, uh, Rados, Libratus. Uh, we have the object store. We can use the fancy stuff HTTP to do those kind of things. And for the people who are a little bit, let's say, more traditional in the mindset, they can use the block device layer to do so. But apparently, there's quite some demand out there also to use uh, a POSIX interface uh, to, to Ceph, uh, which has its own challenges. Uh, first of all, you need additional components in your Ceph cluster. Before, you need only, without POSIX, you need only, of course, something like, like storage, which are the object-based storage devices, and you need the monitoring system, the monitors for that one. Now, for the additional tasks of the POSIX layer, you need this metadata server. And all the things you have thought about, how many OSDs do I need? How many monitors do I need? How do I set them up? Uh, what about high availability? What about network connections? And so on and so forth. You have to do the same considerations again on the metadata server layer. Now, luckily, on the OpenStack side, because Ceph is highly integrated into OpenStack, we don't need this really. This is needed somewhere else. So for today's presentation, we, we're going uh, to skip that one. So the point I wanted to make with this little journey through the Ceph universe was, yes, Ceph is a storage solution for OpenStack, a highly integrated one. It works very well. But it's not the only use case, not the only business case to do so, especially if you have a quite a heterogeneous data center or a data center which was evolving over the years. So there might be some traditional workloads which you want to migrate also to a new storage solution. And then you can converge those things. You can have your Ceph cluster for for your infrastructure as a service using OpenStack, but you can use to a certain extent the same hardware, the same software also to put on traditional, put on traditional workloads on, on that one, either using it as an object store or using it uh, as a block device, or if I really can't help it, then even with the, with, with the POSIX layer. And there are different ways of running that one. Uh, you can use the community version and have the technology or the, the technical skills, the technicians in-house, and they fix everything whenever there is a problem together with the community. Or if you are less mature and you want to have some more consultancy, then you go for the more enterprise products, uh, which have better support for rolling upgrades and things like that. And if you're even more traditional, you can also buy products based on Ceph. Of course, there's a Red Hat product, Red Hat storage based on Ceph. Of course, there's a SUSE product uh, based on, on Ceph as well. So there are really a whole variety of uh, ways to, to manage and uh, to introduce Ceph in, our, in your environment, uh, regardless of using OpenStack uh, or not. What is true for all of those use cases is, okay, 
it looks good on, high, uh, on paper, uh, but for your particular workload, for your use cases, you have to tune the things. And there are things you don't want to uh, fall into. And this actually is now the main talk, uh, or the main part of the talk. And my <coughs> friends from Urantis will cover that part. So what you have to think about, about the sizings, what are the magic numbers, as Dimitri mentioned uh, at the beginning of the talk. And with that one, I hand over to Craig, who guides you through the hardware planning for, for that one. Thank you. Hi, folks. I'm Greg Elkenbart, CN Technical Director from Mirantis. Um, we've been working with CEPH for quite a number of years, and pretty much it is um, our standard uh, storage platform that we start with. Um, obviously, we support others. We support extending the storage through addition of, let's say, NetApp or an EMC enterprise, and you'll see why that is necessary later on in the slides. Uh, and we also support Swift um, as a scale-out multi-data center object uh, option. But let's go through Ceph hardware planning. Ceph is an SDS. It runs on white boxes. So what kind of white box uh, do I want to pick? Uh, well, uh, so what you have to do is you have to analyze your storage needs. What is your net storage requirements? Uh, because Ceph will use an n-way replication configurable between 2 and n. Uh, typical number is 2 in lab, 3 in production. How many IOPS do you really need, uh, both aggregated uh, per your entire cluster and per VM on the average uh, and on the peak? Uh, what are you optimizing for, cost or performance? There's probably an, uh, quite an order of magnitude between uh, the low-cost self-configuration uh, that's optimized for bulk storage uh, and um, high-cost, uh, high-performance configuration uh, where Ceph can start competing with some of the tier one, tier one and a half offerings. Okay, so there's a few rules of sum uh, for Ceph sizing. Uh, so basically, you do want to provision a 10 gig NIC uh, per about eight to 10 hard drives. Um, if they're SAS, if they're SATA, you're probably building out the bulk enclosure, so you don't need quite as much capacity, so you can have up to 12. Uh, by the way, folks, I believe we're posting these slides later on, so feel free to take pictures, but you don't really It's still have nice to. to see people doing it. Uh, right. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, we're very photogenic. All right. Um, so one of the main features that you want to do if you're optimizing Ceph for performance is you want to include SSDs for write journaling. Now, Ceph actually uses SSDs uh, one of two ways. The default Ceph configuration has write journaling. Um, where uh, all of the writes are logged to an SSD device, then replicated uh, to all other targets and then acknowledged. As you can see, uh, since Ceph is synchronous, that is a very important component to reduce uh, Ceph write latency. Now, when would you do that? Uh, so when you have a significant fraction of your I.O. being writes, uh, because you're sacrificing spindles, so you will reduce your read performance somewhat. Right, so it's a little bit of a trade-off, but typically 90% of our Ceph environments include a write journal. Ceph also has recently introduced um, a cache tier, which can be all SSD, and we're currently deploying it in a number of uh, accounts. Uh, in there, Ceph is going to be uh, reading and writing uh, to uh, the SSDs. All right, so, but for your base storage tier, how much RAM do you need? Well, rough guidance is about a gigabyte per terabyte. Um, so if you're not using um, erasure coding, if you're not using SSDs, you can probably turn that down a little bit, but don't do it too much because Ceph does use uh, memory uh, to log it uh, to, uh, for write replication to the other targets. So you probably don't want it to start uh, reading and writing that, that stuff from disk. Um, how much CPU do you need? Well, the typical guidance is about uh, one gigahertz per hard drive, uh, but we noticed in our testing that uh, the SSDs uh, actually need quite a bit more. Uh, one to two cores per SSD in your caching tier. Uh, now, this presentation is not gonna cover the caching tier um, so much, but um, um, in our blog post um, after the summit, we will uh, explain how to start using and planning for your caching tier. Uh, self mount sizing. Well, uh, basically, scrape some hardware together, uh, pretty much. Uh, you need uh, roughly um, uh, one monitor per 15 to 20 uh, OSD nodes. 
so uh, the minimum is three. Uh, that means if your cluster is less than uh, 60, you probably don't need any additional ones. Uh, if it does, you need to add them, uh, and the number should be odd. Uh, Ceph is a uh, majority quorum device. All right. So uh, let's say you wanted to build uh, your Ceph cluster, and you wanted to figure out how much IOPS it will deliver. Uh, you can make some assumptions about your workload uh, if you don't have it fully characterized. The typical workloads we've seen out there um, are roughly 70% uh, read, 30% writes. Uh, and it looks like, um, unless you're running some specialized applications, just the generic I.O. adds up to small random block writes, which means that in order to get the performance, you're going to need lots and lots of spindles. Um, so uh, Ceph is an SDS. It's a software. There's going to be packets flying all over the system. So how efficient Ceph is? Well, uh, us and a bunch of other vendors have done some benchmarks and found that in general, um, and these are very, very general numbers, uh, just use them for guidance, uh, Ceph is going to be relatively efficient on reads. Um, you can consider it to be 88% efficient uh, of your maximum spindle capacity. So if your spindle can do 100, uh, 250 IOPS, uh, Ceph can do roughly 220. Um, uh, on the writes, because Ceph has to do replication, Ceph is going to be slightly less efficient, but still pretty good at uh, 64%. So you'll see how those numbers add up when you calculate uh, system sizing. So let's go through an exercise. Let's say you had to build out a petabyte cluster. It's actually a fairly substantial one. Uh, remember, the CERN cluster, I believe, is only three petabytes at the moment, and the dream host is 10. Uh, so, but you're going to have lots of big, big VMs, and they want lots of storage, so you're only going to have 500 VMs. Uh, where do we get 100 IOPS? Well, 100 IOPS is a pretty good guidance target uh, for general storage planning. Um, obviously, if you're running a database, you're not going to be happy with 100 IOPS. If you're running a web server, you're probably going to be overjoyed if you, if you even get that from your cloud provider. Typically, some of them I've seen providing up uh, as low as two or three IOPS per person. Uh, because they were so always deprived on their I.O. But uh, that means that you need about uh, 50,000 IOPS aggregated from your storage cluster. So let's go through some numbers. Uh, so uh, Ceph monitors, like I said, get some hardware, uh, something to scrape off the ground. Uh, uh, one CPU, 64 gigabytes of RAM, uh, a little bit of hard disk, and make sure you have a 10 gig NIC. Um, so one per every 15 to 20, don't forget minimum is three. You have to add them to make sure that you have maintained an odd number of monitors for reliability. Um, all right, so you're going to be building a low density performance optimized cluster. Now, obviously you can dump stuff on a bunch of SSDs. Uh, I've seen people do that. It's a little expensive and you need giant release because right now uh, uh, without giant, the SSD performance is not that hot. Uh, but um, our standard server, and this is no endorsement of HP, uh, you can use Dell, uh, UCS, um, any other one or two U rack mounted server. We typically stick with a two U. Uh, it uh, forms a relatively small failure domain in a larger cluster. Um, it has a decent enough performance uh, where the network and the memory does not get saturated because in the larger systems, those are going to be large problems. Ceph is relatively high performance. You can get two, three gigabytes uh, out of your OSDs uh, with the right I.O. pattern. Uh, so um, you're going to be building out uh, using um, basically six core CPUs, uh, whatever is uh, relatively um, inexpensive. Uh, remembering, of course, the ratio that you need of uh, cores to storage. Uh, how much RAM? Well, if you're going to be having, uh, what is it, 30 terabytes, uh, that means uh, that you need roughly uh, 30 gigabytes uh, of RAM. But however, uh, remember that Ceph runs on Linux, and the more RAM you have, the more disk caching you will be using, so the more reads and write, the more reads are going to go from RAM. This is your only opportunity for read caching. Um, unless you're deploying your dedicated cache tier. Uh, so you probably want to bump it up uh, modular two to the next fraction power or even increase it further if you want to optimize the writes slightly. Uh, you do need some drives for the OS. Uh, they probably should be separate. 
uh, from the mainline drives. Uh, so now let's talk about the bulk of the performance drives. Uh, we've chosen the 20 1.8 terabyte SAS drives and we put them at 10K RPMs to get a decent number of IOPS through the system. Like I said, this is performance, not cost optimized. Obviously the 1.8s are relatively expensive now. You can do 1.2s, you can do the 900s. Um, so, or if you don't have the performance needs, you can probably tune it down to about uh, 700. I probably would not go uh, to 3.5s. Uh, in a performance-based system, you're just going to lose too many spindles. Um, all right, so SSD write journals. Um, um, Seth is not terribly hungry for the journal space. 20 gigabytes uh, should be quite enough uh, per OSD. And remember, the ratio should be uh, four to six uh, hard drives per SSD. Uh, so that Intel uh, should be quite sufficient. Now, the SSDs get a little tricky. Uh, some of the vendors uh, um, actually cheat and they do not include the right number of write channels uh, on the lower capacity SSDs. So take a look at your specs. You may have to up-spec your SSDs um, if you do not um, have enough write performance. Remember, this device will be heavily utilized for writes. Um, so take a look at the spec and find the sweet spot. At some point, uh, you, the right number of chips will be there, the right number of controllers will be there, and that's the point where you want to buy, uh, which means that you probably will have more SSD capacity than you need just to get the right performance. Uh, now, uh, like I said before, Ceph is going to be uh, relatively bandwidth intensive. It's um, an optimized system. Uh, you should be able to push um, out at least a gigabyte, probably more, more like two, uh, out of this cluster. So in most of our 10 gig environments, uh, we've seen Ceph um, under stress to be network saturated, uh, not disk I.O. saturated, especially in a system like that or in a larger system. So why not a 40? Well, uh, it's nice, but typically a 40 is a little too expensive uh, for most people. Um, and um, honestly, we haven't done a one gigabit Ceph deploy except outside of somebody's lab. So most production environments do use multiple tens at this point. Uh, okay, so um, how many servers do you need? Well, yes, I know uh, a thousand is not a petabyte, but let's round up uh, or down, shall we say. So a thousand, um, you have 20 uh, drives in the system the size of the drive 1.8, and there's a magic number on there. What does it mean? Well, Ceph is going to be using some um, regular storage system on Linux underneath it, and uh, XFS, which we typically use, does not like to be full. So we're going to leave some space, both for Ceph to reallocate blocks in case of a failure, and also so XFS does not have to start uh, fracturing its extents uh, and start losing its performance. Uh, so. Um, I've chosen 85%, uh, conservative folks choose 75%. Some people I've seen push it up to 95% and don't leave any reserve for anything uh, in the system. Uh, but hey, it's not my money, right? Okay, so 98 servers are necessary uh, to serve about a petabyte net. Uh, so that means they're gonna have roughly three petabytes uh, raw um, of uh, drive capacity hanging around, uh, consuming power. And yes, it will consume power. Most of the time, we do not spin down the drives. Um, so, uh, all right, so where did I pull 250? Well, from my hat. Um, I went to Tom's Hardware, looked at the drive model numbers. Um, actually, this one is not tested yet because it's brand new. Uh, so I looked at one model down. It was uh, hovering somewhere between 290 uh, and 300, and I said, uh, through all of the IO meter random IO benchmarks. So I said, ah, 250 looks like a good number. So uh, I, I do use Tom's, Tom's hardware fairly extensively uh, for um, uh, IO benchmarks. Honestly, I have not found uh, a site that spends as much time and money on testing various hardware components. Um, if you have a better one, please recommend it. Um, uh, so unfortunately, most of the uh, manufacturers seem to not to bother including um, iometer uh, specs just because they don't want to see how badly they suck. So uh, we have to go to independent third parties. Um, all right. So this cluster, uh, remember, we're going to use an 88% uh, read factor. 
uh, will be generating somewhere north of uh, 430,000 uh, uh, IOPS. That's an awful lot of IOPS. Or you're going to get 800 IOPS per VEM. So that is really great, uh, but don't jump for joy yet. Ceph does have a latency issue, uh, and its latency is typically 10 to 40 milliseconds. So even though the IOP count is high, I would not be using it to run your high performance databases. Medium ones can go ahead. Uh, yes, you had a question? Uh, so it's 250 times 20 times 98 times 0 0.88. So. And a quick question. On the 20 drives that you have for the OSG, are those configured as JBOD or are they? JBOD. So when would you need RAID for Ceph? Um, so uh, we typically uh, try to make sure that our cluster does not have more than a few thousand OSDs and we typically configure one OSD per hard drive um, in our normal environment. So uh, if you have lots and lots of hard drives and you have a very, very big cluster, it makes, makes sense to combine them uh, using some sort of a RAID. Uh, so where did the 1000 came from? This is an old limitation a few releases back on the efficiency of the Ceph monitors and the crash algorithm. Uh, it's been removed since, but we just slowly, gently ramping up our guidance from 1,000 drives to 2,000 drives to 3,000 drives as we test bigger and bigger clusters. Uh, so we typically do not use RAID. Uh, so uh, the, there is an interesting point. So you have a RAID card in there. What do you do with it? Um, if you have an older six uh, or three gigabit card, uh, use it in JBOD mode, turn it off, uh, get rid of it, uh, do something. Uh, get it out of the data path. Um, if you have a 12 gigabyte, gigabit card, especially one of the newer LSIs, you can use uh, RAID zero mode on the individual device just to get a little bit of write caching and smooth out the XFS barrier writes. Um, all right, uh, so the write cluster rating um, is a little bit lower and you're gonna have about 600 uh, um, uh, IOPS uh, of VM capacity available. Uh, did I make a math error? Uh, yeah, looks like I did. Sorry. Uh, uh, that should be a 64, not 88. Sorry about that. Thanks for catching it. All right. Earlier you said one of the metrics you would look at is peak per VM. How do you drive peak in this? You have to understand your applications. Uh, so as a storage guy, I cannot tell you what your peak applications are. Uh, on the average, I would assume uh, that you about, need about 100, but if you're, let's say, running uh, database workloads, those, that's going to be your peak requirement. No, I, I think you misunderstood me. All right. how, how would you determine what the limit in your design architecture is to deliver peak IOPS to a, any particular VM? Ah, I see. All right, so uh, currently, um, you shouldn't plan on being able to deliver more than a few thousand IOPS uh, using Ceph to an individual VM. Right, so if you need 10,000 IOPS, there are some other systems uh, that uh, use uh, some zero copy magic and others to get to be, to be more efficient. Um, uh, so I've seen a few systems which are right now in beta which are capable of delivering roughly about 30,000 IOPS to an individual VM, uh, but they have extensive use of zero copy. Now, uh, Ceph does run on ICER, uh, on Melnox ICER cards. Uh, we typically do not add yet additional third-party card or the 40 gig switches in the environment. So if you were using the ICER branch of Ceph, you can probably increase your IOPS uh, to the whole, whole host and to the individual VM. Uh, all right, okay. So, um, Folks, uh, let's keep the questions to the question section because we're running out of time and we still have some material to go through. We'll be here after the session so you can come up and ask questions. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that, Dmitry. All no, right, uh, let's run through this. So let's say you have bulk storage, you wanna use Ceph uh, as your object store, uh, or you're just scrolling away data, 
uh, and you do not care about the performance. Uh, so uh, you'll be using a uh, higher capacity uh, chassis. You're probably gonna go to a four-year <coughs> chassis with let's say 36, three and a half inch drives, or probably even higher. Uh, how ridiculous can you get? Remember, Ceph is a uh, modified DHT ring, uh, which means any system failure uh, requires a replication in order to restore uh, write resilience, uh, read resiliency. That means that no system should be more than 10% of your total pool, right? So larger, 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 larger clusters can take larger systems. Smaller clusters require smaller systems. Do not put Ceph on two super giant boxes and call today. Um, okay, so uh, since you have lots of hard drives in there, you're going to need more CPUs. Uh, you're going to need a little bit more RAM uh, because you have lots and lots and lots of uh, terabytes in there. Uh, again, uh, two drives for the OS. Uh, sometimes people put the OS on the SSDs in order to save the two drive slots. Uh, so you're going to have six uh, SSDs on there, and you're going to go with four to six, depending on your needs, uh, terabyte drives. Three and a half slow drives. So, uh, by the way, they're not that slow nowadays. Uh, the performance is decent. Uh, they're pushing those IOPS on the enterprise versions uh, above 100. Uh, you're going to bond the NICs. So, in this environment, you're not going to get the maximum streaming capacity of your drive. If you do the testing, you'll find out your NICs are going to be saturated on the public side, uh, get serving all of the read IO. Uh, so if you need to get streaming read capacity, you probably need to get to 40 in a system that size. Uh, all right, uh, so you're going to need only 32 servers uh, to um, serve uh, one petabyte, so the magic number 85% still counts. Uh, and then, uh, I, again, I went to Tom's Hardware. Uh, that drive is somewhere between 170 and 190 IOPS and various random IO benchmarks, so I said, 150 would be a safe number. Um, you can be as conservative as you want to uh, and simply overbuild your cluster. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so that means that that cluster roughly has, um, if you notice, probably about a quarter of the performance of the cluster before, even though it has the same capacity. Uh, and it will serve about 200 IOPS per VM uh, on the reads and about 150 uh, IOPS per VM on the writes. Uh, Look, no typo on this one. Um, all right, so that means it's barely good enough uh, to meet your performance needs. Now, we sized it relatively ridiculously low because normally a petabyte cluster will, will be used by more than 500 VMs. So you can see that this cluster will not, uh, will not be satisfactory to primary block storage needs of a larger clouds, but will work very nicely as an object store. Um, all right, uh, okay. So uh, what about SSDs? So if you're doing all SSDs in Firefly, you are limited to about 5K apps. Uh, so you're not gonna get maximum amount of performance. Giant uh, ha takes a giant step forward. Uh, we saw roughly about 30K IOPS, but it's not available out of the box because Giant is not LTS, and we only include LTS releases. Um, so. Uh, right now, we are not delivering the maximum performance uh, clusters available, but by the end of the year, there's going to be an LTS release uh, that will be around 30 to 40K IOPS uh, per SSD, and then uh, cache interiors will start being very important in Ceph, especially if you start to compete with the Tier 1 systems. Uh, all right, so I'll forward it to Dmitry for lessons learned. Sorry about taking the time. That's fine. We're actually having, we'll have some time for questions. So lessons learned, right? First of all, how do we deploy uh, Ceph clusters at Mirantis? We have a software called Mirantis Fuel. It's an open source tool which we use as a basis for deploying Mirantis OpenStack clouds and also deploying uh, Ceph layer for Mirantis OpenStack clouds to support object storage, to support image storage, to support block storage. So the steps are quite simple, right? Uh, we discover the servers. We define that it will be a Ceph, uh, that it will be a Ceph powered OpenStack cloud. Uh, we assign roles to the servers which we have discovered and decide to make them uh, Ceph OSD nodes. Uh, we allocate disks, so we specify where the journal will be, where the OSD will be, where the operating system will still sit. So this, I mean, you need to make sure that the SSDs will be actually used for the journals you bought them for. 
Um, uh, a couple of other options to consider is whether you want to put Nova ephem ephemeral drives to Ceph and get like fully Ceph back system with uh, all the disks of VMs being put on Ceph and natively enabling live migration for you, right? Um, what else? <laughs> block storage, uh, so block storage goes to Ceph. Object storage, uh, we can expose Swift API to, uh, that you can later give to your tenants to consume object storage, like, like, like there is a Swift cluster here in the cloud. Um, images get backed by Ceph also. So as we, as we mentioned earlier, that gives some needs, uh, this gives some neat features such as copy on write for images at VM boot. When instead of doing the full copy of image from the Ceph, you will just do a copy on write and this, I mean, this allows for quite a rapid spin up of big portions of VMs backed by Ceph. So what we now know practically by building clusters over the last couple, not couple, but year and a half and actually testing the performance. So uh, in reality, with uh, current release that we are using, are we on, Fire, are fi on Firefly, right? With current release that we are using, effectively in most clusters, the performance of uh, the IOPS per VM is limited to some to somewhat like to somewhat like 100 IOPS per VM, as long as your OSDs are HDD spinning disks. Uh, for fully SSD built system, even though the theoretical IOPS will be sky high, in reality, where uh, like single IO test per VM will give will be somewhere around 10k IOPS. So that's why the earlier slide was saying this would be a disappointment because you would expect much more from an SSD system. So if you're building a full SSD Ceph cluster today, expect to be a little bit disappointed before you upgrade to Giant or the next LTS release. Um, as Greg mentioned, there is a latency problem. So the more low, the, the more low that the Ceph cluster gets, the higher latency may get. So we typically estimated at 10 to 40 milliseconds of latency uh, getting as, uh, as building up as soon as the Ceph cluster gets saturated. And uh, if you if you again go with the way of full SSD cluster and say I don't care, I will upgrade in a year and it will be a beautiful storage platform to work. I will don't need to buy whatever then uh, get ready to spec more CPU power because the CPU gets saturated in such case. Um, and as, as, this slide says, as this slide says, there are certain gaps in how the uh, Swift API is implemented today on top of Ceph. For example, you cannot, uh, you cannot really do the object version in while Swift guys have already pulled this in. So if you're going to expose this, if you're going to just use it as a backend for glands and for uh, RBD disks, probably you're fine. If you're going to expose it to your tenants, well, at some point they may ask you why the hell your Swift API is not supporting my object versioning. Um, a couple of other things. So I was, as I was mentioning, we've been doing, we are doing the deployments using our life, uh, life cycle management tool called Fuel. And I mean, some configuration options we include by default, then we figure out that this is not really working and we need to change it. So we propagate it to customers, we fix it to in, in, in the next release of Fuel, we publish the patches and so on. So first thing we found out, it was in the time frame about OVS 1. 1. 1. something, 1.2 something, I guess is that you don't really want to assemble bond, bonded interfaces with OVS. Uh, as soon as you get them saturated, uh, as soon as you get them saturated, the CPU load goes high, uh, the Ceph performance is not very good. So our recommendation today, and that's how we do out of the box with the product, is to assemble bonds using native Linux bonding. That works much better. Uh, another thing is that Ceph, uh, the Ceph bridges, which you will be, will be putting, to, putting together on Ceph OSD nodes, so bridges for Ceph public traffic, bridges for Ceph replication traffic. You need to make sure that you will not put them through OVS. Again, in our case, it was uh, OVS 1. Point something. Some folks are telling me that if you go with OVS 2.2.3, I guess, or something like that, uh, it gets fine. But really, there is no reason to introduce one more switching layer in front of the performance, performance uh, in front of storage network, which you really want to be as performant as it can be. Uh, Nova Evacuate, the holy grail for many people trying to do VMHA on OpenStack. It hasn't been really working with RBD-backed uh, RBD um, VMs. In Kilo, they landed the patches. Honestly, I haven't yet tested. I don't know, maybe someone in Mirandis have tested. Uh, if, it, if it really works with the Kilo code base, it means that with an external monitoring system, it will be quite neatly and quite easily today to implement the automatic HA for, 
staff backed VMs. Uh, network collocation, so in some cases we've been doing and we've seen folks doing uh, collocating the Ceph management network with, uh, Ceph, uh, with Ceph public traffic. It is possible in some situations you want to do it to reduce amount of ports and reduce amount of uh, network interfaces you need. Uh, if you're free not to do it, better not to have a dedicated NIC pair for Ceph public traffic and not, not, not used for anything else, unless obviously the cluster is very low performance. And uh, test, testing, testing the self configuration. So obviously, whatever default one, uh, whatever default one comes with a distribution with the software that you're using, it's usually not the best optimized. Uh, if you track the fuel, uh, if you track the fuel project progression, we raise bugs from time to time and uh, enable this and that, like RBD cache and other things, and make sure that they are shipped out of the box to the customers using fuel. So. Yeah, the rule of thumb, just make sure you're using the latest version of fuel. If you're a Mirandis customer, check with your SC or with your consultant on what are the latest best practices on staff because this is still a quite, a quite a dynamic area to optimize on. Okay, I guess we're in time. Let's open for questions. Go ahead. We only tried Giant. Yeah, repeat a question for the <coughs> recording. Uh, excuse me? Uh, have we done performance testing on okay. Hammer? Uh, we have not uh, run Hammer through the lab yet. It's still on the backlog for the performance testing lab. So far, we went as far as Giant. Giant did improve the performance ex uh, very substantially. Um, so uh, we will pro uh, Hammer, I believe, is the LTS release, right? That's coming up. So we'll probably be going to Hammer um, as soon as the Hammer is available and expect Hammer performance to be a little bit better than Giants. <clears throat> Sorry, for the rest of the questions, we have to take them offline because we're actually out of time. Out so, of time? Yeah. So we're not. So okay. keep them and ask us afterwards. Thank you.